Welcome back to my channel, everyone. We are going to get started today and jump right into this tutorial on how I made Penny River Costumes 18th century mitts pattern. I am going to be using a wool pashmina that I picked up at a thrift store sometime last year. And then on top of that, I ended up having way too many of them. And this one is going to be sacrificed for the project. One of the things that is essential for doing this is you need to find the bias with the pashmina. It was really easy because it's literally the woven edge on either side. The bias is going to be that 45 degree angle that provides it a lot of stretch. Wool is really stretchy on its own, which is why I wanted to do this project for the first time in wool. I figured it would be one of the more forgiving options I would have in front of me. And the bias is going to be super stretchy. So if I end up needing a lot of movement in my forearms or in my wrist, this fabric and this cut are going to give me just that, which makes me super excited. The little points on a finished pair of mitts are often showcasing a contrasting fabric of some sort. This one in particular, I'm just going to do the little triangle. I'm not going to fully line the wool sleeves. One, my wool isn't super scratchy. It is one of those wool woven pashminas. And I don't have enough of the silk because it's a piece of cabbage that was in my stash from working on a pair of 16th century sleeves for one of my friends. It is a sort of orangey color shot with black which gives us this really pretty copper and I have just enough cabbage to do this and maybe a couple other things. I'm letting my chalk lines be pretty wide to give me just a little bit of extra seam allowance again because I haven't made this pattern before and I want to make sure that I'm airing on the side of maybe squishing in an extra eighth of an inch rather than really wishing I'd had it. I ended up not needing the extra bit and the points of my mitts ended up being extra line, which isn't the worst fate in the world I could have had. Marking everything out with chalk first did make it really easy for me as I kept moving stuff back and forth, trying to sort this out your fabrics aren't being as forgiving as mine were, you might want to consider thread marking them. Speaking of marking things, I had to try and figure out how to get the, the little lima bean shaped thumb hole cut out of my actual pair of mitts. One of the things this pattern did really well is it starts with that hole being small and then you can cut it out to be larger and fit around your thumb more easily. I found it just ingenious and I loved it. But I still had to figure out how to get that little shape transferred from the pattern onto my fabric. I tried this tracing wheel. Um, I use it a lot for doing some Frick and Ponce work with my embroidery. I've used it a couple times to try and mark out stitches for leather work. But the holes just ended up being really tiny. I love that it's super spiky and it definitely went through everything, but the holes just weren't big enough to really let the chalk fall through them. And I didn't have any loose that I could find at this particular moment. This was kind of a two day random afternoon project. You can sort of see the faint outline of the chalk as it tried to get through all the tiny holes but it wasn't dark enough for me to feel super confident cutting that out. So instead, I'm just gonna cut out the little hole that is on the pattern. I saved the little lima bean shape in case I need it at some point down the road for a reference point. But by cutting it out, I was able to trace everything out with chalk and then fill it in and cut that out of the fabric without having to keep pushing down my chalk into these tiny holes, going back and forth. It's 
So if you're of team pattern cutting, like I am, don't be afraid to do this, because it's going to save you so much time. I, If you have a way you prefer to do this, feel free to talk about it down in the comment section. I would love to see how all of you tried to work your way around this. I didn't follow her instructions exactly, I'm not going to lie. I mostly tried to make these and then went back to the instructions when I had a question or I was unsure. Marking out the, the seams on all of my mitts was super helpful as well. That meant I had a spot where I could constantly put the pattern back down as a reference point and know I was being consistent with that. And because I want them to match and my forearms aren't terribly off from each other, I needed that little cutout to be in approximately the same place on each of my hips. So I'm going to just flip these over and do it again. If your stuff has a pattern to it, where there's an obvious right or wrong side, you really want to make sure that you're flipping your pattern pieces over and being super aware of that. Because these are very much a, you have a left and a right side once you're done. Again, doing the plain wool for this was super awesome and wonderful because it meant that if I had screwed this up, I didn't have a right or a wrong side necessarily. I could use the same for either one. Next up, I decided that I needed to have embroidery because I am extra. And if any of you have been watching this for a while, you've probably figured that out. I ended up going and starting to do some research in a library cast off book I'd found when I was living in Arizona, and it is all about early American embroidery. A lot of it you're going to find from, it's basically all colonial, it's going to be pre-19th century or just at the end of the 19th century in this book. And the farther back you go, like the mid-18th century, this pattern was taken from a wall hanging that was approximately embroidered in 1752. The farther back it goes, the more it starts to look like late 16th, maybe early 17th century embroidery, which I thought was super cute. I love my Jet Jacobian embroidery patterns, and I thought I would do a cute little twig and berry situation on my forearms. The embroidery ends up not looking quite like that by the time I'm done, but it's worth a try. This is where I officially have to start paying attention to my rights and my lefts and having all of the markings be correct because I don't want to have two right-handed mitts or two left-handed mitts. The easy way I found to do this was to put them side by side while I was drying out my pattern. And my little chalk marking wheel that I'm using is biting me tooth and nail. The wool is just nappy enough that it keeps catching on the little blades. And on to some embroidery. If you've been following me on Instagram, I'll link how to find me there down below. You might remember that about a month ago I sliced my finger open at work with a box cutter. I'm fine, but this is my first project back from that injury. And I really wanted to be nice to myself, which is why it's a small project, and why I'm doing such simple embroidery. It's pretty much all stem stitch or split stitch. They are stitches that were being used. I can see them in the book that I was referencing earlier. I'll put the information for that book down below, but like I said, it was printed in the 70s. It is way out of print, and I wish you all the luck finding it. But I thought I would do some cute little pink hawthorny berry looking things. And they ended up looking a lot more like little rose bushes by the time I'm done. At least I think. They're filled in with a 
sort of spiral pattern of all of these cute little stem stitches. And once I realized they looked like roses, I started embracing that and I just filled it out more and more. I really wanted to do this embroidery before I started assembling anything, and that's why this became a two-day project, because I spent the entire day falling down the research rabbit hole of finding an embroidery pattern, and then watching a bunch of my fellow Coztubers and trying to do this cute little piece of embroidery. So if you want to embroider them and make something that's a little more elaborate like this, plan a little bit of extra time. It, a little more than a one day make for me at least when I started doing that. So what you don't see that I did is I basted the top and the bottoms of each of my mitts. That gave me a much easier time trying to stitch these curves. I wasn't fighting as much with pins after having basted everything in place, and I could then just slip stitch everything together by applying the lining over the top. This also encased the back side of my embroidery, which is gonna keep it safe from any rings I might be wearing, general wear and tear, and gives us that cute little contrast I was talking about before. But because mine are a single layer, Thankfully, wool is pretty forgiving. That is our mantra today. But I can go in between the fibers and take just tiny stitches, so they're not gonna be super visible from the top side around my embroidery. And at the same time, if you don't like doing this kind of stitch work, you can always fully line them and then just kind of bag line it out. The little point ends up being a little bit interesting, for me at least. Um, I believe she tells you to clip the edges, which is what I just did there. And it helps roll that, that little corner at the edge of your point forward and have it lay flat while you start doing some of your sewing. Next up is everybody's least favorite part, at least as far as I can tell from online blogs and instructions, and that's setting in these little thumbs. I have already sewn the little inseam for the thumb and hemmed the edge. I left the bottom part that connects into the body raw. That way I could try and stretch that over things a bit and not have to worry about it nearly as much. And order of operations will always tell you that you need to cut out the thumb hole before you can attach a thumb, which I had conveniently forgotten. So don't mind me as I quickly try to carefully cut out those little chalk lima beans that I had already created for my thumb. I was trying to follow that edge as much as I could while not cutting it out excessively and make sure to do it on both. This is one of those projects that it was easier for me to work both of them simultaneously and flip back and forth between left and right instead of trying to complete one knit from head to toe and then go back and recreate it. Learning on one knit then made it much easier to go back and do the second one and make sure I had it right. So the basic instructions that I got was that you drape your mitt with the little point in, 
and then you put the thumb on over it. And from here, there's the stabby pokey part. Everyone that I had chatted with that it's made these pricks themselves just a little bit, setting those pins in. Not enough to bleed, but it's enough to remind you that sharp things are sharp. So be careful when you're setting these in. It doesn't have to be completely perfect because you're going to fix that as you start trying to set everything in and make everything smooth. So my goal during this step right here is just to try and smooth everything out and make sure it's fitting correctly. If I have weird lumps or something going on with my thumb, I want to try and adjust as much as I can. That way I have less that I have to adjust when I'm sewing it together. And then there's the face when you realize that you forget to flat fill your seams. So I had made the mistake where I did not finish encasing the thumb seams. And the thumb is something that's going to get a lot of wear and tear. And it was also part of why my thumbs weren't sitting correctly into the mitts. There was just too much fabric at that inner fold of your thumb. So I got to take both of the thumbs off, fix them, and I thought I would do this little thumb dance for you guys to demonstrate why you need to go and French seam that tiny little one inch seam on your thumb. And here's some cathartic seam ripping just because we've all been there. We've all made those mistakes. I didn't feel like it was fair to you to not show those mistakes every once in a while. Now, once I got my hem taken out of the edge of my thumb and pulled all the little strings, you want to flip it so that the seam is going to be encased. It looks like it's right side in. And take a little piece of thread. We're going to roll and finger press this little one inch seam and then do a back, uh, running back stitch along that seam to start encasing it and keep those raw edges from becoming an obscenely frayed out nasty mess right at one of the most functional joints on your body. So wiggle the thread back and forth a bit, anchor it, and then just do those running back stitches. It'll save you a lot of heartache in the long run, even though wool doesn't fray as much as some of the other fibers. I probably could have gotten away with it. Pashmidas tend to be more loosely woven and I just did not feel like risking it. And like I said, it really changes the fit of how the thumb works when you're making it in a light to mid-weight wool. Once you finish that seam, you're going to want to roll the French seam to one side or the other. Maybe trim a corner of it to help cut down on some of the bulk. And re-hem this. I just did a quick blind hem. You 
people call it a magic M, that sort of thing, to make a quick little seam around your thumb. Now that you've gotten to watch me fix all of my thumb issues, trying to hem it and then reinforcing that thumb seam, it's time to set those back into my mitts and make sure that they are completely flat and drafted and ready to go. I'll save you guys happy to watch me reset them, but let's move on to sewing them down onto the mitts themselves. Seems like a good use of our time, right? Now, once you set this onto your thumb hole again and get everything repositioned with your pins, go ahead and bury your thread underneath one of the little folded edges. You're going to start folding under the thumb, repin it, and do a slip stitch to keep everything in place and slip stitch around that folded edge of your thumb. Hi, Zoe, who I can see bouncing around at the bottom. And I had to come back because Zoe needed outside. But we got to readjust the camera, and you guys can see a better image of me doing those slip stitches. And sorry it keeps falling out of frame. You really want to be stitching these, especially at that little point where it goes into your thumb seam over a curved edge. And short of trying to work all of this around a tailor's hand, I was bending it over my little, three littlest fingers up to the middle finger to try and give it more of that curve that your body's gonna naturally have and start training the wool and the stitches to hold that shape on its own. It's a really simple tailoring technique and it's invaluable when you're doing stuff out of wool and you're trying to shape it. So one of the biggest benefits of wool is that it does take shaping. So you want to try and use that to the best of your benefits. Now that your thumb is completely attached and you take a moment to enjoy the fit and check for fit, you're going to want to flip it to the wrong side again or your inside of your mitt and start trimming away the excess fabric that you don't need from the body of the mitt. That way you can start stitching under these sides. I erred a little bit on the side of leaving too much in rather than not enough. You could trim this down a little bit narrower, but if you do trim it too narrow, you may have to use something like a tape or some very fancy cross stitches of some sort to try and trap all of your seams and raw edges. Because my, remember when I said that my points were a little bit long, with that extra length they actually went down into part of the thumb seam on the lining. So this is me just trying to tuck under that silk edge too with everything else so I can catch the bit I clipped into the seam and prevent myself from having raw edges hanging out everywhere. So once you've gotten a start for this and you've started training it, you don't have to use as many pins. My pins were mostly for the silk, but 
this needle folding scene that they were talking about. Basically, you're trying to encase everything in sort of a, what I would think of as a modern flat fell scene, where you kind of roll the edges under there and you're almost doing a slip stitch. I guess it is a needle fold. It's This is part of why I wanted to do the tutorial so you guys could see really what that scene looks like and get a nice close-up detail on how to make that work for yourselves. If you have a really good proper name for this scene, please feel free to tell me what you would call it down in the comments. I just was having fun with the technical aspect of how can I encase these scenes while I started sewing. And as a reward for having completely finished your thumb holes, you can flip your tippet back and forth, or sorry, your tip back and forth, and you're going to start pinning this seam together for your bias stretch along the edge of your arm. I started with my pins at the edge with a couple of crucial points at the widest part of my hand, my wrist, and two along my forearm. And then I just started walking those pins in and adjusting the fit as I needed to to make sure that it was going to be the right fit for me. And then to sew all of that together, you're going to do another one of those running back stitches. And don't forget to encase your seams again on this one. It's slightly less important than the thumb seam, but it is still going to help. I made sure that I was stitching just barely inside of my pin lines and the stretch of the wool because it is so stretchy. I didn't pull it skin tight, I just pulled it taut-ish. When I then went back and I started doing this French seam, it completely encased all of my raw edges and it pulled it just that extra hair tighter to give me the really awesome fit that you're going to see here towards the end of the video. Once you finish your long French seam, don't forget to go and hem the bottom part of your palm as well as your cuff up towards your elbow and bicep. I'd hate for you to do all of that work and then have all of those rough edges hanging out over your edge. 
I personally, at this point, found the basting stitches I had done on the first go round kind of pointless. So I pulled them out and then just proceeded to do that same invisible little hem stitch to try and encase everything. And as I pull it tight, it sinks down and keeps all of those stitches encased and pretty. The trickiest part of hemming either the wrist or sorry your palm or your arm cuff is going to be getting that front seam to lay flat. I ended up trimming mine back just a, a little bit to help cut down on the bulk I was going to have in my hem and then I rolled it just like everything else to start encasing those seams and I used that seam as a tie off point so I could do a couple of knots. And my mitt is done. Flip it right side out. Enjoy some wonderful, wonderful stitching. Figure out if there's anything you forgot. And try on your finished mitt. And I'm not going to subject you to watching me go through and stitch all of that a second round through the magic of video editing. Why don't I just show you a second completed knit? Isn't that better? Two adorable Mayday mitts with some cute little roses and a luscious burgundy wool with some silk to help keep my hands warm because for some reason even though it's late April, it keeps snowing. Oh, Colorado, I love you, but what's with the snow? Anyway, I hope you are all having a magical day. If you found this tutorial helpful, please go through and click that like button. It helps get this tutorial out to other people that might find it helpful. And if you want to see more cute things like this, go ahead and click that subscribe button and see more of my stuff rolling through your feed. With that, have a great day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.